Hello, everybody. Um, we are going to start uh, the live teaching Wednesday in just a few minutes. Um, I'll wait until we can get a few people logged on. It's always the most awkward part of a live video is when you're talking to yourself because no one's on yet. So I'll just give it a few seconds. Um, I hope everyone is having a great day so far. Um, I pray that you guys have had a blessed morning, blessed afternoon. For any moms that are in nap time right now, I hope nap time is going well. Um, I also just want to start by saying uh, thank you so much to um, Mo, my aunt, um, for and Sochi for trusting me with um, doing another live teaching for Unforsaken. Um, it's a huge blessing to me every time I get to every time I get to do one of these. So thank you so much, um, and I hope that uh, the word that I have today um, blesses someone else in here too. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention before I actually jump into the teaching was that um, we want to let you guys know about our um, Everlasting Joy Retreat happening on June 1st and on Forsaken for this month coming up on April 30th. Um, so April 30th is going to be our, our typical um, Unforsaken Women. So we'll have live worship, we'll have a message from Mo, we'll have some refreshments. Um, we always have our vendors uh, giveaways there. So um, if you are interested in coming to Unforsaken, please join us uh, at the Black Box Theater on April 30th in, uh, in the Claremont Arts and Rec Center. And then our Everlasting Joy Retreat is going to be happening on June 1st. Um, if you've never been to one of our Everlasting Joy Retreats, I highly recommend that you come to one. Um, it's so nice just being able to spend a day with other women of God, um, just refreshing yourself and your faith, um, renewing it uh, for a whole day. Um, I believe this time it's going to be from 9 to 4 or 10 to 4. Um, so it'll be a little shorter than we've had in the past, um, but it's just so much full of fun and full of faith and, um, and worship then too. So if you've never been to one of our Everlasting Joy Retreats, then save the date for the one happening on June 1st, which I'm sure we'll have some info out on soon. Okay, so I'll just jump straight into um, the teaching for today. Um, we are going to be in first samuel so if you have your bible um go ahead and get your bible i always love um keeping keeping my physical bible kind of on hand um because i feel like there's something so uh so important about just like a paper bible because on our phone we have so many distractions that can pop up i can be reading a scripture on my bible app but then the next thing i know i get a text from one of my friends and, and i want to go check what that was and um, everything like that so highly recommend um, whatever you can using you know a hard copy of of your word just to to keep us focused and keep us in it um so again this is going to be in first samuel um and first samuel kind of opens up with um the story of uh of samuel's birth so um Samuel's mother was named Hannah, and um, she was infertile for many years. Hannah struggled with infertility um, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Um, it says that she was one of uh, Elkanah's two wives. So it was Hannah and Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. So Hannah was struggling with, um, with infertility. And it says that they used to go up year by year from their city to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. Um, so year after year, uh, Hannah, Peninnah, and Elkanah, they're all going um, up to Shiloh to, um, to worship God, uh, to worship God at the temple. Um, and this temple is where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. So remember Hophni and Phinehas because they're going to be important later. Um, so Elkanah's two wives, Hannah and Peninnah, Peninnah had children. Peninnah did not struggle with infertility while Hannah did. Um, and what was really unfortunate was that each year when they would go to the temple, um, Peninnah would make sure to really rub it in Hannah's face um, that she couldn't have children. Um, it says here in chapter 1, verse 5, um, that to Hannah, um, to Hannah, he would give a double portion. So uh, Elkanah would give Hannah a double portion of food because he loved her, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. Um, so we hear directly here that um, it was God. It was God closing uh, Hannah's womb. It was God who was preventing her from having um, any children. And in this time, in this age, it was really uh, shameful 
for for women to not bear children. It was kind of one of the biggest um, components of a young woman's life was her her transition into motherhood from being a wife to a mother. Um, so unfortunately, Hannah dealt with a lot of shame and a lot of ridicule from Penina, her husband's other wife, um, because she couldn't bear children. So. Hannah was distraught by this. Hannah, obviously, she really wanted to be a mother. It was one of the desires of her heart to be a mom. Um, and so after dinner once uh, at the temple, she rose. Um, and this is, again, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verse 9. It says, After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped worshiped before the Lord, and then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. So now that's a lot of text there. Um, but Eli was a priest. Eli was called um, from the Lord. He was appointed by the Lord. Um, and he's really integral, uh, integral in Hannah's story because um, as Hannah is in her grief and in her suffering um, for, for being infertile, he finds her uh, weeping outside of the temple. And um, Hannah was so faithful in that when she was suffering, when she was grieving about her infertility, um, she could have tried a million other vices to try to uh, ease that pain and that suffering that she was feeling. Um, but she goes out and she prays and she goes directly to God. And, um, and she begins to pray that if, if he will grant her a child, then she will give him back to the Lord. And obviously the Lord does give her a son. She names him Samuel because she says, I have asked for him from the Lord. Um, so Hannah follows through with her word and after she is given Samuel, she waits until he's weaned, and then she brings him back to the temple. So she goes back to the same temple that she was praying at when Eli, the priest of the Lord, found her weeping. And Eli is the one who's basically going to be in charge of, of shepherding Samuel now. So it's really cool to see it come full circle because he was there when Hannah was weeping and praying for her son, and now he's the priest that's kind of overseeing Samuel's uh, discipleship. Um, so it says, um, when they find Eli again at the temple, this is in chapter 1 and verse, let's see, verse 25. It says, then they slaughtered the bull and they brought the child to Eli. And she says, oh, my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord, and as long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. Um, the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. That's what it says in chapter 2. Um, so we can see that Hannah follows through with her word. After she prays to God, she petitions God for a child um, to, to end her infertility. God grants her Samuel, and then she keeps her word to the Lord. She brings him back to the temple where he's basically going to spend most of his time. He's going to be discipled and raised in this temple under the, under the um, discipleship of Eli, the priest. This is where our teaching kind of starts to come in. Eli was a spiritual father to Samuel, but Eli had biological sons of his own. The problem is that Eli's sons, the Bible says that they were worthless men, and they did not know the Lord. 
what's interesting is that um, in chapter one, we saw that they went to the temple where Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. So they're priests in this temple where people are visiting and worshiping the Lord, and yet they didn't know the Lord, right? So um, it seems as though it might have been one of those things where because their father was a priest and their father was a man of God, they kind of fell into that same, into that same calling, into that same profession, but they didn't actually know God. So they're sitting here doing the Lord's work in the Lord's temple, but they weren't walking with God, and they didn't have their own personal relationship with God. They didn't have the same reverence for God that their father did. Um, it says that basically they were defiling the offerings being given to the Lord. They were um, being sexually immoral with the women that were visiting the temples. Um, and this was obviously very uh, disgraceful to the Lord. The Lord was not okay with any of this, especially coming from the sons of one of his trusted servants, Eli. Um, Samuel continues to grow in his discipleship and continues to grow in his faithfulness under the watch of Eli. But Eli's biological sons are off being disgraceful to the Lord and defiling the offerings being presented to the Lord in the temple. Um, and it says that Eli rebukes his sons. It says Eli was very old and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to Israel and how they lay with women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. And he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and favor with the Lord and also with man. So we see here that Eli rebuked his sons, but although he rebuked them, he didn't necessarily restrain them from what they were doing. So Eli, in the position of the father, was making it known to them that he didn't approve of their actions, but he also didn't do a whole lot to prevent them from doing it. They weren't removed from their position in the temple. Um, Eli just told them, my sons, what you're doing isn't good, and you need to turn away from it. Um, because of this, the Lord rejects Eli's household as position of priest in the temple. Um, in chapter 2, verse 29, or verse 30, sorry, it says, Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares... I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. Um, unfortunately, because of the actions of Eli's sons, because of Hophni and Phinehas, um, disgracing the Lord and, and not holding reverence for him, he decides that he's going to cut off their line from, uh, from the line of Eli. Um, what this kind of sounds like, where it, says, um, where it says initially the Lord had promised that the house of Eli and the house of his father should go in and out before me forever, but now it declares that they'll be cut off. It kind of sounds like God has changed his mind or has changed a promise there. Um, but it's really important that when we look at God, we are not looking at him through the lens of how people operate. Um, God is not good or bad based on circumstances. We know that in the word it says that God is good always. So even in times when it seems like there might be something that contradicts him or contradicts his word, we always have to go back and, and look at why that happened because we know God, God can't lie to us. God cannot sin, therefore um, he doesn't break his promises and he, and he is faithful to complete them. Um, so it's important to note that God did not break or alter his promise because his promise was that he would work through the line of Aaron. So Eli was part of the line of Aaron. He did cut off part of that line who were corrupt, but he continued to work through uh, Abiathar, who was part of that line as well. So God did not break his promise to, uh, to Eli, but he did cut off his sons, right? Um, so then the Lord ends up calling Samuel up, um, and he ends up cutting off the line of Eli's biological sons. So I find it very interesting that um, Eli, this priest, he was, um, he was called to disciple Samuel, who would be used by the Lord in great ways, and he would be, um, he would be a prophet and a priest and, and one of um, the Lord's disciples. But um, Eli's biological sons were not shepherded in that same manner. So as parents, um, you know, we, we are obviously still individual people. We're obviously still children of God before we're anything else. 
um, and we have callings of our own that God has placed in us. But as soon as you become a parent, um, there is a responsibility that gets placed on you um, to shepherd and watch over your children and to train them up in the ways that they should go. Um, what Eli kind of did was he loved his sons and he cared about his sons and his sons had had a place of position in the temple. They were priests. But Eli didn't restrict them from disgracing the Lord and he didn't restrict them from defiling the offerings that were coming through. He didn't prevent them from sexual immorality. So he is pouring so much of his time and his attention and his devotion into his spiritual son, Samuel. But meanwhile, his biological sons are kind of off doing whatever they want to do. Um, this is a very, uh, it's a very important warning, I think, in scripture to all parents, because um, I think a lot of us, uh, we all have dreams, we all have ambitions, we all have, um, have things put there um, by the Lord, I believe, to accomplish great things as individuals. But we can never allow the work that we do in, in ministry, whether it's our job or whether it's um, this dream that we're trying to uphold, we can never let any of that um, prevent us from training up our children in the ways that they're supposed to go. We have a responsibility from the Lord to shepherd these children, to, to train them uh, to know the Lord. And we also have to remember that although Eli was greatly used by God and Eli knew the Lord, his, his uh, children did not. So it doesn't mean that just because we see someone who, a parent who is walking with God and is with the Lord and cares about the Lord, that doesn't always necessarily mean that that's going to happen straight for our children, right? Um, it's an intentional process to, to teach children about the Lord and to encourage them to have their own faith walk with the Lord. Um, and I think that because this is Old Testament, I love the Old Testament. I love, I love the history books and I love... Um, I love a lot of uh, Old Testament um, history because I think um, I think sometimes we have this perception that New Testament God is different or more loving than Old Testament God, but that couldn't be further from the truth because when the Lord cuts off Eli's household from continuing to be um, part of that priesthood, when he cuts off um, the, the sons that were wicked, um, he is essentially doing what Eli failed to do with his sons, right? Um, the word says that the, the Lord disciplines those that he loves. Um, and I think he really did. I mean, he loves all of us, of course, and he really did love Eli, and he really did love Eli's sons. Therefore, he had to discipline them where Eli wouldn't. Eli would tell his sons that he disapproved, he disapproved of their actions, but he never restrained them from participating in it. He still was an enabler in a certain sense and allowed them to continue that way. Um, so I... I feel as though, and, and you know, I, I'm a working mom myself. I, I don't think this is, uh, this is a warning for working parents versus staying at home parents. I think both are incredibly crucial and I think both are wonderful parents. Um, but I am someone who loves what I do. I work in ministry um, and I could so easily mistake that for, um, I could easily mistake the ministry that I do out of my home as more important than the ministry that I do within my home. And I think the word is very clear that the ministry that we do within our homes is top priority to God. We are raising up that next generation of believers. We are actively raising people who will um, do incredible things for the kingdom and change the, change the world. And I don't think God takes that lightly at all. Not to say that what we do outside of the home isn't important and, and not to say that that doesn't have eternal impact as well. Um, but I think God is very clear that regardless of what we're called to do outside of the home, the work that, that we have placed in our homes is very, very top priority to the Lord as well. Um, Eli was absolutely a man that walked with the Lord, and Eli did a lot of incredible things for God, including um, discipling and shepherding Samuel. But while shepherding his spiritual son, he neglected the responsibility he had to his biological sons, to his family. Um, so I felt called to just remind, um, remind us all that um, we always have to check our priorities and we have to check where we're balancing um, our lives because our lives, I think, naturally want to drift to going out of balance or going out of whack. 
Um, and we have to be so intentional about making sure that we keep that hierarchy in place where God is our number one. God is our first priority. There is nothing that we're placing above him, be it our family or our children or our work or our ministry. God has to be number one. And then following that, that becomes our, our spouse. You know, if you have a spouse, then, then your spouse needs to come second to the Lord. Now, if you have children, they come after your spouse. Um, and then very last would be work and then hobbies and extracurriculars and everything like that. Um, anytime you place anything outside of that hierarchy and outside of that order, um, discipline has to happen. You have to learn how to train yourself to reprioritize and reshift your focus back to the mission that God has called you to first. And, and that walks with our identity too. You know, I am fir first and foremost um, a child of God, a daughter of the Lord, and then I am Jonathan's wife, and then I am Rowan's mother, and then I am a worship director for a church and for unforsaken women, and then I love to read, and I love to uh, paint, and I love to do all these things, but if at any point in time I try to shift those around, and I try to say, first and foremost, I am worship director for a church, worship director for unforsaken, um, that's going to get skewed, right? That's going to become out of balance, and and God won't bless what isn't in, in balance like that. When, when he has given us a template for how we're supposed to lay things out, um, I think it honors God most when we, when we keep things in hierarchy and we keep those priorities set. Um, oh, amen. Yeah, I just saw that. Uh, with, with much is given, much is required. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, the Lord, the, Lord places, um, the Lord places us in different places and in different seasons for different times. Um, but it's a high responsibility, you know, being being a parent or being in ministry or being in any any role really. Um, even in the workplace, I think every time your um, every time your role gets more advanced or you move up, more is required of you, right? You're you're required you're required to be held to a higher standard. Um, and I think that the Lord really does He disciplines those that He loves. So every time, you know, I feel that. Uh, that my life is kind of shifting out of balance again and I'm kind of giving the best of myself to the things that are lower tier versus giving the best of myself to God and then giving the best of myself at home to my husband and my children. Um, you can feel yourself start to experience those things like burnout and you can, ex you can start to experience anxiety and stress and depression because your life isn't being structured the way that God had intended it to. Um, so I just kind of wanted to just encourage us today to really... Um, Kind of look at our lives honestly and ask God to uh, to look through our hearts. In, in, in the Psalms, I think David wrote, um, you know, examine my heart, God. I think that's such a powerful prayer to pray to the Lord, just being honest with ourselves, being honest with him. Like, God, look at my heart. Look, look and examine my heart and show me the areas where I haven't fully surrendered to you. Show me the areas where I am prioritizing things incorrectly, God. Like, show that to me and reveal that to me so that I can do the work that I need to do to better myself and to, and to, further, uh, to further myself in my walk with you. Um, I think it's super important to constantly just keep that at the forefront of our minds and remember that um, whatever is first in our life, that is what we're going to give the best of ourselves to. And that spot will always belong to God. And then next to that, that'll belong to our family. And then after that, that'll belong to our work. Um, Eli was a great man of God, but he, he prioritized things incorrectly and he did put God first. I believe, I think he did put God first, but he put his work, his ministry for the Lord before he, he placed that uh, priority on the ministry of his home and, uh, his son suffered for that and he suffered for that. Um, and I feel as though God's just calling us, uh, in uh, calling me in this season to just really examine, um, you know where those priorities lie and how um, we can consciously put that effort into um, making sure all of our priorities align with his word and what he's called us to do. Um, that's, that's the live teaching for today. Um, I hope that uh, this was useful to you guys. I hope that um, the Lord can use this to just reveal to you further ways where um, we, can, we can push deeper in our relationship with him and we can push further in our walk with him. And I did just want to do one more quick reminder about um, 
on Forsaken at the end of this month, happening on April 30th. Live worship, live message, it's going to be so great. And then um, our Everlasting Joy Retreat on June 1st. Just again, if you've never been to one, I highly encourage you guys to join us for one. Um, they're so great, just refreshing us in the word and um, in our faith with other women of God, um, which we'll have more information out on soon. I hope you guys all have a very blessed day.